Hi, everyone. Welcome to International Careers Week. We are so excited to have all of you here. I have a special guest, Carol, who is going to be talking about international journalism. Carol became the chief editor of Arms Control Today, a monthly journal on arms control and nonproliferation in April 2021. This followed 13 years as a member of the New York Times editorial board, writing opinion pieces on all major national security issues, including nuclear weapons, China, Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan. I just also want to take a time to thank our sponsors, Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Clearwater Credit Union, Humanities Montana, and Stockman Bank. Over to you, Carol. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today and being interested in this topic. Um, I'm going to just give you a little bit of uh, insight into my background, and then um, we'll take questions, which is really where I think the more inter interesting discussion will come. So before I became editor of this small magazine, um, I was a journalist for longer than um, certainly all of you students have been alive, and probably most of the other people on this on this um, uh, Zoom. Uh, I started out. Uh, I, I decided to become a journalist when I was twelve, and this was kind of bizarre uh, because most people don't sort of set their career path so so early. But I loved politics, I loved writing, and I really was very committed in the notion of the importance of a free press and a democratic society. And I felt a, a real sense of mission about this, about uh, informing people about the world, informing the people, first of all, about their local community, then by the country, uh, the larger country, and then eventually um, in, on an international basis. But I, uh, so I, I, I just sort of started doing things that would bring me to where I am today. And I worked on my high school newspaper, I worked on my college paper, I got jobs at the local newspaper during the summer. And when I graduated from college, I couldn't wait to get a real job as a real reporter. And I was lucky enough, the, the newspaper industry was in a different place then than it is today. And I was lucky enough to get a job at the Lowell Sun in Lowell, Massachusetts, which was a very ethnically diverse city. It was a fascinating place to learn to be a journalist. And, uh, and they paid me $85 a week, which was, um, you know, a pretty low, low salary at the time. I made $5,000 a year, but I was, I mean, it was a different time. I had, I was single. I had very modest needs. And uh, frankly, all I cared about was the fact that they gave me a job to be a journalist. Uh, as time went on, I moved to the Hartford Current in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, that newspaper then sent me to Washington to cover Washington for them. Uh, eventually, I was hired by Reuters News Agency, which was um, and is uh, one of the most prominent international news agencies. And I thought, you know, great, I'll get this job, I'll hitch my wagon to this international organization, and I'll eventually go and live overseas to cover the world. As it turns out, I was based in Washington by choice, but, but the jobs that I had uh, there allowed me to cover the world and allowed me to travel. Uh, sometimes I was on the road, you know, uh, one week a month. And so I first started there in Congress. I covered foreign policy and defense policy in Congress. That's really where I learned the basis of everything I, start, I got to know about the world and foreign policy and how policy was made in Washington. And eventually they sent me to the State Department. And when you're working for a major news organization at the State Department, 
one of the important tasks that you do is cover the Secretary of State. And so I traveled the world with uh, eight or nine Secretaries of State to every major story, every major international story that was going on during all the years that I was doing that. And um, as was mentioned, uh, eventually I moved to the New York Times to be the person on the editorial board who wrote editorials about foreign policy issues. And that was a very different role. Being a journalist, I was writing news stories and news analyses that were, I had a responsibility not to put my own opinion into those articles. On the editorial board, the, the, the role was very different because I was writing the opinion of the newspaper and we actually did take a stand on every issue that we wrote about. So the, the roles were very different. We can talk about how, that, uh, how those roles function in journalism, but uh, that was what I did for 13 years. And again, you know, I was writing about every major new, uh, every major foreign policy and defense policy story that came down the road. Um, and then, uh, as was mentioned, a couple of years ago, I left the Times and I uh, went to work as the chief editor for a uh, small magazine called Arms Control Today. And we write uh, exclusively about disarmament, nonproliferation. So there, we're writing a lot about China, um, a, a lot about Iran. Uh, the issue that I'm putting together now is focusing very heavily on North Korea and concerns that the North Koreans and the South Koreans could uh, stumble into a, a real conflict. So why don't I stop there and uh, I'll take questions. Awesome. Well, I'll start off while other the students are typing in their questions that I will read off to you. Um, can you describe the role of an international journalist and the key responsibilities involved in reporting on global events? Okay, so there, there are a couple of ways you can, you can do this. You can be a journalist who is based overseas in a particular country uh, you know, and you and the country becomes your area of expertise. For instance, you know, if I were assigned to China, I would be focused, first of all, on China, and I would look at the world from a Chinese perspective. You could also operate as an international journalist by being sent by a news organization to a conflict zone to a country uh, for a short time to cover some discrete event, you know, the war in Chechnya. Um, you know, you could be sent to do a piece as some Reuters journalists were sent to do a series of pieces in Southeast Asia about the uh, the trafficking trade, the human trafficking trade in Southeast Asia. Uh, or you could do what I did, which was I was based in the States and I covered international events from the perspective of the United States. Um, you know, that doesn't mean I represented the US view. I wasn't like advocating for the US view, but, but my, the place where I was based is the United States, which is the major player in most, certainly many, uh, uh, you know, events that are going on around the world. And so my primary source base was, was in the United States, but uh, I also had sources all over the world, so I use them quite frequently as well. Um, Okay, so th those are the ways that you can actually carry this out. Sorry, uh, what was the rest of the question? <laughs> I was saying, what are the key responsibilities involved in reporting on global events? 
Okay, ba you know, again, it's a little different from place to place. Uh, basically, you're looking for the news. What's the news? What do people have to know about in order to understand the major issues of the day? Okay, so if you're, you're based in Beijing, one, one of the big issues of the day are the, you know, the Chinese economy. And so you would probably spend a lot of time learning about the Chinese economy, talking to businessmen, talking to officials, to the extent that they will talk to you, um, talking to experts, talking to businessmen in China, and trying to really understand what the drivers are in the Chinese economy and what it's likely to do in the near term and the long term. And why is that important? That's important because the Chinese economy is a huge economy. Uh, it depends on what statistics you go by, but it's, I mean, it seems like most people still feel like the United States is still the biggest economy, uh, but China is certainly number two or number three. The EU is also a very large economy, and it's a huge driver in both, you know, prosperity or, or not uh, everywhere around the globe. So, um, so, so one of the things you would do is report the news. What are the biggest stories? If there is, you know, if you're covering, <clears throat> you know, say Turkey, and there's an earthquake in Turkey, you're going to go and cover the earthquake. What, you know, how big is the destruction? What are the needs of the people who are affected by this earthquake? And also, you know, how does it affect Turkey's economy and Turkey's the, the political situation? Does it have ramifications for, for Erdogan's ability to stay in, in power um, and for the stability of the country? So you're looking for the biggest and the best stories. You're also looking for slice of life stories that will give people maybe who have never been to China or have only, you know, gone to uh, say South Korea and you know spent, spent a couple of days in Seoul, you know, you're trying to give them a, a, a deeper sense of the culture and the people. And so you look for uh, interesting stories that will grab people's attention and enrich their understanding of the people and places where you are responsible for covering. Um, you know, from, from the United States perspective, you know, we also did um, not just straight reporting, but a lot of analysis, which is to try to step back from the news and take a broader lens and, you know, pull strings together so that you, so that people can get a better understanding of, say, you know, why the United States is providing military equipment to Israel, or, you know, what are the problems with the Iran nuclear deal? Um, so you get to, um, you know, you, you look for the best stories that you think will have the most meaning to, to readers. How do journalists approach the challenge of presenting accurate and unbiased information in an era of rapidly evolving news cycles and digital media? Well, it will come as no surprise to you that this is, this is harder than ever. You know, when I was back in the day, when I was covering the Secretary of State, we did not have cell phones. And uh, I, that, that was great, I thought, because when you got on a plane to travel with the secretary, you had, you know, there were huge, we, the, the distances we traveled were quite large. And so you would have hours uh, in which to think, to talk to officials on the secretary's plane, to write your story, to read, and then be prepared to, once you got on the ground in the place where the news was going to happen, you would be prepared, you know, to just get busy really quickly. Today, and I, today, of course, people have cell phones, and you can, uh, you know, sometimes they, for 
forbid you from using phones on the on the plane, but sometimes you can use them too. And so it's like your your bosses can get you anywhere. Uh, so the the pace of news, the pace, the demand for getting stuff out even more quickly than usual um, has accelerated. Um, you have uh, you know all sorts of social media. It used to be okay if I when I was with the wire service, I would do I would do my reporting, I would write my story, and I would do it very quickly because that is the stock and trade of the wire services to get news out quickly. Um, but now uh, you, you don't even have time to write an entire story. Once you sort of hit the ground, land in a, in a location or <clears throat> once a news conference starts, um, you, you could be filing just off the first few words that an official says. So it's, it's you know, that interjects even more chances of error. So you, you know, it just raises the bar for how you can do the job, be, you know, deliver it quickly, but also deliver it accurately to people. That's even worse is the fact that we now have problems with, you know, incredible amount of hacking. Everybody, every news or a big news organization is being hacked in some way or another by by some foreign country. And then you've got uh, artificial intelligence and the idea that, um, you know, chat GPT, stories can be manufactured, images can be completely uh, falsified and it makes it harder and harder to um, verify, you know, what's, what's real and what's not. Uh, I mean, your, your standing, your reputation as a journalist depends on being able to be accurate, not just fast, but accurate. And that is getting harder and harder to, to, to do. How has social media impacted your job? Well, those are two, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, those are two, uh, you know, idea uh, uh, factors, um, which is, you know, it really, it really has changed the, the business quite, quite a lot. And um, I would say a, another sort of feature of social media is the way in which people will go after you. You know, if you post your, a story on, doesn't matter which site it is, you know, if there's somebody who wants to discredit you and you're reporting, they... Um, there are a lot of people who are very skilled and have large followings and they will, uh, I'm sure some of you students have uh, probably experienced this at a smaller level, even within your own communities. If somebody gets mad at you or somebody doesn't like you, you know, they can, they can um, take after you, take, you know, after you on social media. And I'll give you an example of, um, something that happened to me, which sort of really opened my own eyes personally to this. So <clears throat> there's a, a former official in, a U, in the US government whom I knew when he, he was in government, I was a reporter, we got along just fine. His, we're, our politics are very different, but we had a very professional cordial relationship. He's out of government now, I'm in this new role. He, this was a couple of years ago and he, posted something on social media and I thought it was cockamamie basically, but I, did, I didn't say that. I, I said to him nicely on social media, um, actually, no, I didn't respond on social media. I sent him a private email, okay? I sent him a private email and I said, hey, you know, Joe, uh, you know, you're a smart guy. You, you don't, you had, that hasn't been your position. What, what do you mean? What are you doing? But it was sort of inflaming the discussion about this. You're, you're too smart. You should, you know, come back to a more reasonable position. I was just talking to him privately, 
not in an, I mean, neither of us were in an official capacity at that moment. He takes my email and he breaks it up into parts and he sends out a succession of tweets just slamming me, okay? First of all, revealing our private conversation, slamming me and thousands of his supporters for like three days, there were endless, endless, endless sort of pushbacks against me. Not, none of these other people knew me at all. So that's just an example of the degree to which um, social media, uh, as much as it can advance debate and the exchange of ideas, it can also inflame debate in a very negative way. So that's, it, I think these days it has more of a negative uh, effect than positive actually. Have you ever covered stories that put you in danger or you felt like your life was in danger? <laughs> yes. Um, you know, uh, years ago when I was, through most of my career, um, Journalists were really were the background noise. Um, you would go to do a story and people would talk to you and, or they would not, sometimes they wouldn't talk to you, but you know, it was like all, all pretty cordial. And I felt um, very safe no matter where I was, all right? Whether it was when I was a young journalist and I was covering night cops in Hartford, Connecticut, and I'd drive around by myself, and I'd be listening to the police radio, and if they, somebody said, you know, there's a fight going on, or there's a murder, or something, I would go right to the spot. It would be my, me, myself, middle of the night, going with the cops, and I was never, I was never fearful. No one ever hurt me. It was cool. In the early 90s, after communism fell and um, the Secretary of State was going to Moscow pretty frequently for talks with the Russians. Um, I was uh, very frequently, I, in order to get from, there wasn't, there wasn't much public transportation in Russia, in Moscow in those days. This, the, everything was very pretty primitive. The services were primitive and, um, so I often found myself having to go from a news event, also late at night, to my bureau, to the Reuters bureau. And the only way I could get there was by going out on this main road and holding up a pack of cigarettes and, and, and enticing somebody to pick me up. Basically, I was hitchhiking. And and again, you know, I probably should have been more fearful than I was, but nothing ever happened. Everything was fine. Today, okay, modern world, uh, <laughs> uh, we journalists are in terrible peril, whether it's here, uh, it's here, certainly, but even more so in other countries. More journalists have been killed. Um, uh, more journalists have been harassed. And, and jail. You can talk about, you know, Russia where Putin, you know, kills his enemies um, to Turkey where Erdogan has put lots of journalists in jail. Uh, China, it's a problem as well. And a lot, lot of other countries, I don't mean to just cite them. Um, but personally, uh, there were two times when I actually came under fire. Um, and one was in 2003 when I, uh, uh, during the uh, Iraq war, and I went to Iraq with uh, Paul Wolfowitz, who was then the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And um, he, he had been criticizing reporters. I was in a conversation with him once and he, he didn't feel we were covering, you know, what the good things that were happening in Iraq. And I said, well, you know, I'll go with you. I'll go with you to see what's going on. So we went and on the last day of our trip, 
um, at seven o'clock in the morning, we were, let me set the scene. When you travel with a principal like the deputy secretary of defense or the secretary of state or something like that, you stay in, you, you travel on the plane with them and then you stay in the same hotel that they stay in. So we were in the Al Rashid Hotel in Baghdad on the seventh floor. Wolfowitz was down the hall, you know, and I was in a room with two other women. And at seven o'clock in the morning, we start hearing noises. And we thought it was a car backfiring. We thought it was a, a, a soldier just sort of emptying his gun in a pile of sand. And then there was this huge explosion. And it turns out that uh, Saddam Hussein's um, members of his old uh, army uh, were attacking the hotel because Wolfowitz was there. And so um, we had to evacuate. One person was killed, 16 people were injured. And uh, you know, so that was kind of a, a scary situation. And then I had one other situation where I came under attack and that was in Afghanistan in 2012. Um, I had gone with some reporters and the governor of one of, uh, of, one of the Af uh, Afghan provinces out to a Taliban uh, controlled area. And as we were trying to get back in the helicopters and leave, the Taliban started shooting mortars at us. So um, the, the governor took off in his helicopter and we were left on, <laughs> we were left on the ground for an hour um, sheltering in a, um, in a, uh, um, an armored vehicle until the NATO forces could, uh, quiet the Taliban forces. So, but that's, you know, those were two, I was in and out. I, I was in and out. I, the, the journalists who really sort of paid the price and, and really were courageous were the ones who were there on the ground every day. What, who inspired you to become a journalist? Well, <clears throat> you know, as I, I started off saying, I, I, um, I decided when I was 12, well, look, I grew up, I went to Catholic school, okay? I wanted to be a nun. I wanted to be a nurse. <laughs> I wanted to be a teacher, okay? Oh, this was all before 12. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I got to 12, I really decided that um, I really loved politics. I was fascinated with national politics. I love to write, and I really was um, quite idealistic and passionate about the need to hold powerful people to account. And that, to me, is what you know drew me to journalism. I mean, this was a way journalism was a way to do everything, you know, to do politics, to do writing, and to uh, you know fulfill my, what I saw was my commitment to holding powerful to account. And, um, and fortunately I was able to do it. Um, one, you know, in those days, girls usually got married and had kids. And if they did do jobs, uh, professions, uh, they were nurses and teachers. And one day my father, who was an Italian, um, first generation Italian, guy, very conservative, but a wonderful father. And he sat me down. I was the oldest. And he, and he said, you know, you really ought to think about doing something else other than being a journalist, he said, because, you know, if you went, once you ha get married and have children, you know, if you're a teacher or a nurse, you know, you'll have more time with the kids. And I loved my father and I, I respected him. And I thought about it for 10 minutes. And then I said, nah, nah. <laughs> and that was the end of it. And he never, they, neither of my parents ever, they certainly didn't oppose me and they encouraged me in everything I did. I was lucky. How has your job impacted political elections? 
How has my job affected elections? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I think as a, as a journalist, it's really hard to say um, how, what impact, if any, you ever have on anybody. Um, I, I mean, I can't say it ever affected any election for sure. I will say that I think that um, I, I, I will say like, okay, so when I was on the New York Times, one of the things we did was we wrote a lot about the nuclear deal with Iran. Okay, so because I was, I was there during that whole negotiation when um, the Obama administration reached an agreement to put that would put limits on Iran's nuclear program, and Trump eventually uh, tore, tore it up. Um, but we were the only major paper in the country, um, sort of advocating on a regular basis for this for for diplomacy with Iran and for this deal in particular. And, um, you know, it barely got through Congress. And, uh, and so I think we did have, we, we had some small impact, at least uh, in kind of keeping, um, making an argument for, for that agreement. Uh, I mean, I, I thought it was a, a good agreement then, and I still think it's a good agreement. And I think we're poorer now because uh, we're in worse shape now because that agreement was um, abandoned. In your experience, how do journalists navigate cultural differences and diverse perspectives when reporting on international issues? Well, you know, there can be, uh, that can also be an issue here in this country because, you know, if you go um, to, if you go cover bikers, okay, I don't, I don't know, I know one biker, I know two bikers, okay, but I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a communal group in and of itself. And I don't spend a lot of time with that communal group. So if I were gonna go and do a story about them, I would really have to spend time learning about them, kind of getting them to trust me, you know, and understanding their whole lifestyle. Um, so just, to start out, it that that can also be an issue in the United States because we're there are a lot of very different communities in the United States. We're not all the same, um, but when it comes to being overseas, um, it can be very tricky. And um, so, when I was with the Times, um, I had a lot more freedom in my travel than when I was with Reuters because all my travel with Reuters was with the Secretary of State or the President or the Secretary of Defense. When I was with the Times on the editorial board, I would decide myself, you know, probably twice a year I would make, I would, you know, make plans for foreign trips someplace where I haven't been or I had never been or where I had not ever really spent time. And when you go into a different country, let me say, okay, let's pick Iran. Okay, so I spent two weeks in Iran uh, in 2014, I think, when just after Rouhani um, be became president. And you have to, um, you know, I don't speak Farsi, so I had to have somebody who, who could translate, interpret for me. And when you go to a place like Iran, um, <clears throat> you have to use, you know, government approved people. Okay, so we got our interpreter through the government and we got a driver through the government. Now, you have to be aware, obviously, that if 
if you're hiring people that are government approved, <laughs> you know, then the government likes these people and, and, and they are likely to uh, maybe not tell you the whole story or, uh, you know, tell the government about people you're seeing and trying to interview. So it, it does create, you know, a, a particular uh, complicating, you know, factors. Um, and, and also you have to sort of wonder, is the person who's doing the interpreting for you actually doing uh, interpreting uh, things correctly? You know, is, is that person like telling the Iranian person you're interviewing exactly what you said, or are they kind of shading the question somehow? And are they, and vice versa, are they shading the answer from the Iranian person you're interviewing? So, so it's, it gets kind of tricky, but when you're with people long enough, you can generally kind of figure out, you know, if they can, if they're being straightforward or not. And, and in a country like Iran, um, there are a lot of people who speak English. So, um, you know, you, what you do is when you have to have an interpreter, you rely on the interpreter, but to the extent that you can speak to somebody in English or you can clarify an answer in English, um, that's, you, you try to do that. Um, you also, um, and you're not just dependent on one person though. You, you, it's best if you sort of, for instance, well, on this Iran trip, I might as well just sort of string this one along. I mean, I know a lot of Iranians in this country and so they could give me ideas of people to talk to in Iran who would be, uh, who are, you know, who, who, uh, are not government shills and will talk um, sort of more honestly about what's going on there and what their thoughts are and how the people feel and everything. So you've got to be careful about try finding uh, people who you feel are the most authentic, um, you know, will, will be honest with you. Uh, and sometimes that can be tricky, but it's, it, it, it's the sort of thing where you, you can't just go into a country and, um, and just think that, uh, you know, you can just do reporting like you do in New York. I mean, you, you really have to set it up. You have to find people who are authentic. If you, if you, you know, interview a group of people and you don't think you have the whole story, well, then you got to keep going and you kind of keep going and interview as many and as many different people from the government, from the community, from, you know, the churches, from the business community, as wide a net as you can so that you have a, the largest possible uh, field of individuals and the widest possible uh, views uh, to help inform your your reporting. I mean, I spent two uh, in 2017. I spent two weeks in Saudi Arabia, and I had been to Saudi Arabia a number of times before, but never for a very long time. So um, I was really looking forward to to talking to oh again a wide range of of array of people and Mohammed bin Salman had just been uh, elevated to crown prince and I you know I wanted to see him and people in government well they didn't want to see me because I was a female and um so I I said well I'm going to I'm going to do <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to make a uh lemonade out of this lemon and I just got in touch with all the Saudi women I could get in touch with. Saudi women who run businesses, Saudi women who are artists, Saudi, uh, Saudi spent a lot of time with a Saudi woman who does video games. And, uh, and um, you know, I, I got a, some really good stories out of that. 
but you have to be uh, inventive and creative and you cannot, um, just can't assume that what the government, obviously what the government tells you is the whole story and you gotta be really ag aggressive at finding authentic voices. You've mentioned language and translators. Are there any specific languages or regions that are particularly valuable for individuals pursuing a career in international journalism? I would say Chinese. I would say Russian. You know, we kind of let, uh, I mean, I, the Ch Chinese is obvious because it's a huge country and they're, you know, they're the story of the next 50 years, you know, whatever they do, you know, economically or politically or militarily. Um, you know, after the Cold War, we, we kind of let our Russian um, academics um, flag, you know, fewer people were studying Russian, fewer people were, you know, going into the foreign service to to uh, be Russian experts and whatever. And, you know, Russia's, you know, back again in the news is a really big story and a, and a, and a threat. So um, Russia's going, I mean, it's a, it's a big country, it's an important country. And by the way, it has nuclear weapons. So I, I think that Russia is gonna remain a story and we're gonna need also continue to need people who, who know Russia. Um, I think, uh, you know, South Korea is uh, South Korea, North Korea remains an important area, and um, Iran, Iran and the Middle East. So, my last question for you, Carol How important is staying informed about global affairs, and what advice do you have for students on developing a deep understanding of international issues? Well, obviously, if you are going into international, into the international sphere in any way, you've got to, to know what you're talking about. Um, and you've got to stay up to date. Um, there's just no way around it. Otherwise, you don't have credibility. So how do you do that? Okay, so I think that, you know, getting a degree in uh, International relations is, or international economics are, are very valuable places to start. Um, I think that um, uh, you know, same thing with with a master's. If you wanted to go on to to graduate degree, um, I think that you you know you have to read widely. You have to write and know how to write clearly. Um, I, I think, you know, when I got into the business, it was very much as a generalist. I mean, I, I, you know, I had jobs doing, covering small towns, little cities, big cities, the housing authority, the police, the building inspector. I mean, you know, I went through a lot of permutations. I, you know, state government, state politics, all that sort of stuff. And then when I got to Washington is when I started covering uh, foreign policy and defense policy. Um, today, uh, journalism more, I, I mean, I think it, hire, the people who do the hiring still like people with a sort of broad view and an ability to cover a lot of things, but there's also quite an interest in, you know, having a specialty, you know, whether it's say science writing, climate in the Antarctic or something like, you know, or, be, or being interested in climate and wanting to do it from an international perspective. Um, so, all right, so that would be the academics, learning a language, another language and learning it fluently um, is important. That was another thing that was not required of me when I got into this field, um, but more and more people want that. Reading, voracious reading, um, both not just books, but you know, current, um, uh, 
whether it's foreign affairs or foreign policy or the Atlantic or, you know, the Economist or, you know, the Times, know what's going on in the world. Um, and, and then, you know, there are all these other resources with think tanks. Um, I mean, whether it's Brookings or, you know, American Enterprise Institute or Cato Institute or uh, CSIS, I mean, they have all kinds of programming where, which makes it easier for people who are not in Washington or New York these days, because almost all of it is, you know, has a Zoom uh, component. And so you can be out in Montana and you can, you know, if you wanna learn more about, um, say, uh, uh, food development in Africa, you can on any given day, just sort of click on and, and, and get smarter. And that is a huge um, advantage, I think. And, and you've got to stay current with all of that stuff. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Carol. And we are so excited to welcome you to our beautiful state of Montana for Academic World Quest, March 3rd through 5th, and then on a journey to Helena, Bozeman, and Billings. <laughs> so we will see you soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.